back to Montessori for Everybody TV. I'm Susan Zink and I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about how to go into arranging and using the materials in your zoology area of your classroom. This is an area that tends to have a lot of really fun things and one of the reasons that I encourage you to give a lot of thought to how you're going to organize it is the children are drawn to it naturally. I, I don't mean to offend anybody by saying this, but one of the things that I found is when people have some uh, cool little figures, they've, they've found a, a really nice set of, of insects, um, and maybe even they found a nice set of insect cards, and they kind of match them up, and they, that's what it is. It's a matching exercise. And I'm going to say that that has become kind of a default. We have a lot of free printables online and there's a lot of matching stuff. Some of it is to match to um, little figures. And in some ways, that's appropriate. One of the reasons that I'm showing you these insects is that the models of insects tend to be very interesting and they actually add to the children's study of the specifics of the insects. They're probably, I hope, not going to see many ants this side in their own backyard. Maybe they will, but I'd be a little bit scared. I've got to say, I do love insects and I've learned to appreciate them more, but a child can actually get a lot from examining up close a pretty well done model of a rhinoceros beetle. So if you have something that is a pretty simple matching exercise, that would be fine. If it is for three to six, it could even just be photos. I would suggest having the, the labels in there if the children have even learned their beginning sounds because it does help with them being motivated to learn more. If, as you can kind of see what this exercise is, um, has been in my classroom, if you do have cards that have information on the back, this would even be an appropriate exercise in a, an elementary classroom because then when the child looks at the rhinoceros beetle, maybe compares the model to the photo and says, oh, this is a little different. Is it a different kind? Do they just not make it right? Then they can get more information on the back of the card. So there's nothing wrong with a matching exercise, but make sure that you're, you're using it to, to good effect. Now, this is a little model, something that I got many years ago. I don't even know if they're being made anymore, but you can see there's no painted detail. There's just the, the structure of the creature. That's a ladybug. I guess you could paint his little spots black if you wanted to. But, but I would suggest that if you're going to use something like a, a matching exercise, that you avoid models that, that aren't very accurate. This could certainly be understood as a ladybug in a language exercise or even maybe in a, a sorting exercise. So if you want to sort um, arthropods and um, uh, vertebrates or something like that, then you could use something like that. Now, I do encourage you to look for ways to include models that are of the rest of the vertebrate um, phyla. Um, insects are probably the most well-known arthropods along with crustaceans. But our worms are huge in terms of benefit and danger in our world. The, the number of people, not with an earthworm, but with other um, varieties of worms that are afflicted with this as, as an illness are huge. And this is the kind of information that is not very abstract. It's something that even a very young child can understand assuming that you kind of manage the fear factor. You don't want them worried about getting worms, but you can talk about how the clean water that we have and, and things in, in, in most of our homes, that's one of the benefits is because it allows us to make sure that we only take into our bodies the, the, the creatures and the substances that are good for us. But this is actually a life cycle set, and so I would buy maybe two of these because then I can use just the adult version or even even this one with, with the, the, the eggs for um, illustrating the, the phyla of um, annelids, the, the earthworms and other, other segmented worms. Now the, the last thing I want to say before I put my little insects down is sometimes you will find models that are just 
an amazing thing to have in your classroom. If you're going to, to do a unit on uh, uh, or, or, or present some things on insects that live in colonies, to have something like this sitting on your shelf with the cards about in bees and hornets and ants and things could be a really good way to just draw a child in. You could have a magnifying glass sitting next to it. But even if you do, it's not as good as the real thing. One of the things I'm going to say before I go any further about these kinds of materials is wherever you can, have those real creatures in your classroom. Insects are incredibly easy to do. Um, most of you probably know you can order um, caterpillars, butterfly larvae, and, and watch them go through the pupal stage and emerge as butterflies. You can also order um, ladybugs. You can order uh, praying mantis um, uh, egg sacs and, and things like that. So, so look at how you can do that as well as using the environment around you to bring the real thing to the children. And if you have the real thing in, in terms of fossils, then that is, is certainly ideal for your, your study of, of early life, of, of the timeline of life, and, and the creatures that lived on the Earth be, before we did and um, uh, have lived for much longer than we have on the Earth in the case of, of the sand dollar that, that I have in my hand. So, we, I, I talked a little bit in a previous episode that I organize my materials both in terms of the presentations that I give to the children and the way that I organize them in boxes to rotate onto the shelves in three different ways. One is by continent, one is by biome, and one is by classification. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that classification piece. You could see one of the examples of an exercise organized in that way was the insect exercise that I just showed to you. I also am going to mention kind of how to do this, how to do the organization itself. So you saw that I had little plastic bags, kind of some things grouped together in a, a, a red um, basket that I might or might not use on the shelf. It is red for zoology. It is plastic, so it's not my, not my top, top choice, but it is doable. And if, say, I was in the process of updating my storage things, that red one might not ever go on my shelf. Maybe it would just be used for storage in my boxes to rotate things out, and things like a natural wicker tray, then once we had moved on from timeline of life and exploring that, these things would go into a plastic bag and the insects or, or the next exercise could, could go onto this nice uh, tray that would just stay on the zoology shelf. Now, along that line, <laughs> yes, this is a yogurt box. <laughs> and as I was working on this project for myself to get things that I literally have still to this day not got organized to the degree that I would like to in some kind of order to, to share with you, this was on the counter because my husband had just gotten yogurt at, at the big box store and and so that was the reason that I that I used it. And if you can see, I obviously would not use that to put things out on the shelf, but here is an example of a beautiful hand painted tray. Oh, and <laughs> yes, I do have animals sticking to it, and I was actually going to mention that in conjunction with this tray. Um, some of you know that I'm in the process of a move, and most of the models that I have are plastic. And if you're going to use plastic in your classroom, you need to understand some things about it. I do believe in using plastic. Let me see if I can get these. I'm going to just sort of tilt things up so you can see how I've got it organized and then I'll talk about these things a, a little bit at a time. So you can sort of see that there are fish, all fish including sharks and some tropical fish, some rays and things in the bottom of the box. Then I have some minis, I have some invertebrates, and I have some cards about ocean topics. So, 
I'm going to show you something about the plastic. You do need to understand that um, if you are going to use plastics, they are not very stable. And what I found when I pulled this out of storage was that some of my plastic figures, all right, <laughs> yes, my dog is in the room while we're filming. And the fact that she is disturbing the filming means I'm going to sidetrack this for a minute, but it is topical, and I'll explain why. Coco, Coco, come on, come on, come on, come on. You're going to be in the shot. <laughs> All right. So this is Coco. She is my dog. Um, we know that she has, yes, yes, I, oh, yeah, she just sneezed on me. We know that she has terrier in her because of the, the wire hair, um, but we don't know a lot else. Um, people who've had Jack Russells think that she's a Jack Russell. Um, one of the things that I would probably do if I brought her in the classroom, oh yes, I, yeah, you, you're just still sleepy. Um, if I brought her in the classroom, one of the things I would probably do is have the children attempt to discover her breed. Because we were talking about classification. She is a dog. She is a domestic dog. She's not a fox, which would be a different species, but she is the same species as a German Shepherd. And that is interesting to children. And she's a real thing. Now, I know if you're in a public setting, this can be challenging for you. Um, we, we did have dogs in my classroom at a public school. And that the first year, we got a few in before we had to have rules about muzzles and things because, you know, dogs in their an environment that's unfamiliar to them can go a little defensive. But what I'm going to say is when you bring something like Coco in the classroom and you start talking about classification and you start researching animal breeds, things change. When you start talking about why are humans so drawn to animals, and if you have a dog like this, paw, paw, well, sometimes she'll do it. Let's see, yeah, paw, paw. Let's see if I can get her to do it if I do this. Paw. Oh, if I could put her down and still have her in the shot, you would find she has a tendency to use her four legs the way that we use hands. And she will reach out with her paw and attempt to get attention. And that is certainly one of the reasons that dogs are companions to humans. And this is something that the children are very interested in. So the reason that I'm saying this is, if you have a choice of little plastic things or this, what do you think would be more interesting to learn about mammals? Well, I'm going to say that it's Miss Coco. And I'm going to tell her if she barks again, she has to go in the other room. Yes, she wants to, to guard us and make sure that we're, we're safe. And she's seeing her reflection in a window and wondering what's going on with that other dog. So pardon the little, little interjection, but it, as I said, it is on topic. And I'll pick up my narwhal that, that fell when it stuck to the, the bottom of the tray. So what I was saying when Coco decided she was going to protect us is that your plastics will stick to things. And so whatever coating the person who made this tray, obviously another one of my, my thrift store buys, whatever coating they put on there when it was stored in the heat interacted with the plastics and it got sticky. Goo gone, um, lotion, and then alcohol, both ways that, that are relatively low environmental impact to get the stickiness off of something if you have to do that. But what you can see here is I've got some of our invertebrates. Um, starfish, I don't call them starfish anymore. I call them sea stars because they aren't fish and I found that to be confusing to the children. If they do say, oh, but that's a starfish, then I say, yeah, we call them that as well. But because they aren't fish and a fish is a really different kind of animal, that's why I call it a sea star. I've got a ray and then I've got this nasty looking little stone fish. Now, one of the things I'm going to say is that if you are going to use figures like this, what you're wanting to do is not just have a child, you know, play with them and, and, and devolve into fantasy. Fantasy can be a creative pursuit or it can be an escape. And what I found is a lot of our children are escaping into fantasy, whereas if we were to say, what do you think that is? Now, if they have, are, are familiar with these kind of animals, some of them are probably going to look on the bottom and see if they can see the name, and that's fine. <laughs> but what the purpose is, is, so what, what's interesting about a stonefish? What do they do? 
why are they a special kind of a creature in our classroom or in, in the ocean? So I would encourage you to look for ways to use your figures in that way. Find things beyond just matching cards, beyond just nomenclature cards. So the last thing that I'm going to say is, as you are organizing your materials, it's pretty easy to slot them into these different categories. Anything that has to do with the environment, including animal homes, would go in with the animal exercises grouped by biome because that's the nature of their homes. It has to do with the natural environment. Anything that has to do with the endangered status of animals, I would probably slot into your animals uh, with the continents. And also, because, because the way that, that people have developed on continents, the way that people have changed the environment on continents usually has a big, is a big factor in issues of ecology and um, uh, whether or not an animal is, is um, in danger of going extinct then a lot of your materials would be organized by classification. Your cards that show the internal and the external parts of the animal and give those names, classified nomenclature cards of anatomy of an animal, that would go in with that classification piece. So would um, any of your classification where you're actually laying out the animals based on phyla order and class. Anything else that you have, it's pretty easy to see where to slot it in. If you have an animals and babies work, you may find everything you have are mammals. So if so, you'd put them in with the mammals. If you do have other animals in there, it would probably go in with your basic classification. So I hope this will give you some idea how to look at those things you have, because if you're anything like me and at least half the Montessori folks I know that are into the, the pieces and the bits, you probably have zoology stuff you're not using as effectively as you could. So I encourage you to look at it in this way so you can get it organized, get it ready to rotate on, out on the shelves, and ready to use in a way that best serves your children. With some of the materials in the Montessori classroom, it's pretty much a matter of ordering them, possibly maintaining them with touch-up paint and things like that, and knowing how to use them. However, in the art areas, the practical life areas, uh, usually in, in the language area where a lot of card material is, is handmade by the educator in charge of the classroom, there is some prep work involved that makes you have to make some decisions. Decisions on what materials to purchase in order to put the exercises together, what to include in the exercise, and those kinds of decisions. We talked in several different segments of, of our um, program about how to make some of those decisions. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail with a co two concepts here. The first concept is the idea of preparatory exercises. And the second idea is sequencing exercises and changing the level of difficulty. This does relate to rotating out materials in the classroom as well. And so before we talk about those specifics around pouring, an exercise that is, is particular to the, the three to six classroom, but is, does involve principles that any teacher needs to be aware of if he or she is preparing a Montessori environment. I want to say a quick word about rotating materials in the classroom before we go on to these specifics. If you have the attitude of, oh, I'll just change things out when I notice that the children aren't using them anymore, in my experience, you probably will not be rotating your materials as often as you need to. If you have a schedule for rotating materials and you stick to it without varying, no matter what you notice in your observations, in my experience, you're also not serving the children in that way. So there is a kind of a middle ground that I find works almost all of the time, that you need some kind of plan set out ahead of time. So you have some idea of how often you're going to switch things around in your practical life area, possibly in art area, some of, of the other places. If you're teaching in a three to six environment, your sensorial materials are probably going to be out all year, although there may be some things that, that don't show up until a little bit later if you don't have any students who are using them. 
for your practical life area have a schedule at least for each month of the the regular school year and possibly even a little bit more detail than that use that as a guideline make sure you're looking at that schedule at least once a month and making some changes if you do that using your classroom observations to inform the changes that you make your practical life area is going to be dynamic and serving the children well when I visit a school and I and it's November, December, and I notice that there's dry pouring or a couple of dry pouring exercises out, my next question is always, so do you accept children throughout the school year? Yes, no, whatever. If the answer is no, I always wonder why they're still dry pouring out a couple months into the school year because most students will master that very quickly. And my next question is, so who are the new students in the classroom? So if, if, you, if you think about these things, you're going to see that it is going to be necessary to do that rotation for that area to be as dynamic as it needs to be. So let's talk about some specifics around pouring exercises in terms of preparatory exercises and level of difficulty. So typically, if you're doing pouring, you're going to start with either a sturdy, breakable pitcher because uh, the students very likely will drop it at some point. Um, you can see that these two that I'm showing you are, are both pretty sturdy. Uh, this one may be a little bit sturdier. It does have the disadvantage that the children can't see the materials, so it does tend to make it a little bit more difficult, especially when they're pouring liquid. Now this, on the other hand, is a more advanced exercise. So even if you were using this for pouring dry materials, you would certainly be waiting a little bit further into the year to give the children a chance to get, get their, their pouring uh, down a little bit so they were much less likely to break something like this. When would we use plastic instead of glass? When would we use a container's lid? I'm going to do a little bit of an aside here. Um, when I was gathering things for this episode, this is what I found. And I sat for about five minutes trying to wonder, trying to figure out what on earth it was. And what it is, is the lid that is stuck, and I thought, yeah, there we go, the lid to this picture that was stuck on something else that I had. Now, I may at some point had had in mind for this to be maybe something to cover up some kind of a little individual snack or something. You, The reason that I mention it, besides it's just kind of funny that this is one of those Montessori things that happens, is that you may find that a lid from one thing fits another thing and, and can serve you well for setting out snack or, or something else. I believe this is a candle holder. It might be an ashtray. It looks enough not like an ashtray that I have used it um, for, for things in the classroom. Now, when would we use a lid? You can see this is a honey pitcher, which I don't think I would probably use for honey. By the way, um, viscous liquids are much more difficult to manage than, than regular clear liquids or, or normal viscosity of liquids like juice or, or water. So when would we use a lid? The lid can fall off, so that is going to up the, the level of difficulty even if you've got plastic. The reason that I ask these as questions is I want you to think about it. This is one of those areas where you're likely not going to just buy the same dressing frame as every other Montessori school in your town has. So you need to be able to think about these things as you're purchasing materials, setting up materials, and of course rotating them out. So we talked a little bit about the containers, how to, to choose uh, their sturdiness. How about the number? If you're starting with your pouring exercises, then you're probably going to have two pitchers because a pouring spout makes it much easier to pour. So the exercise is to pour, usually to then turn your tray and to pour from the other um, vessel into to the, the first one. So that, was, that, that is a beginning exercise. Now, if you have cruets or something else that has a very small spout, two are probably going to be pretty difficult. So that's one of the ways to make the exercise more difficult. Now let's talk about the idea of preparatory exercises. So 
usually what do we start pouring with something dry I have seen um, pinto beans seem to be especially in some schools uh, with uh, an American Montessori Association a very common first thing to pour rice is also very common you'll see that I did dye the rice I almost always have people ask me how I dyed the rice and the the trick in my experience is to just put the dry rice into food coloring for a short period of time and then pull it out so that your rice doesn't kind of lose the shape so much but it does pick up the 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 food coloring I've seen people spray paint rice don't recommend that but that's one of the ways to color your rice why do we use colored rice or colored water in an exercise just for the, the interest just to draw the child's interest to the exercise this is the same reason that we color code an exercise so if I were going to use this picture I would probably choose my blue rice um, uh, to pour so what kinds of why do we pour dry things obviously the cleanup is much easier than pouring wet things if a child spills all of the pinto beans they could clean them up very very quickly and easily even more easily than pouring rice so what dry things would you pour how about lima, baby lima beans that would probably be fine would you pour pasta probably not <laughs> not not going to flow very well now popcorn is actually fine to to pour I wouldn't eat this but I would definitely put it out in a pouring exercise but in the United States red and green frequently are associated with uh, winter time with the, the Christmas season sometimes uh, red and green are considered to be Christmas colors and would I have dry pouring out at Christmas time or in January right after Christmas time probably only if I had students starting at that time or if I had maybe very young students who were just starting to pour at that time rather than at the beginning of the year as would typically be the case in a three to six classroom so we've kind of thought about most of the things that are involved with the pouring exercises last thing that I'm going to mention is we don't only pour with things with the spout you could certainly use a lovely set of teacups to teach children to be able to pour even when they don't have a spout sometimes we need to pour an untouched glass of water back in a pitcher within a family setting particularly so there is a, a practical application for that so the last piece that I want to mention is these that you the things that we've shown here are preparatory exercises even when it's water it's a preparatory exercise if you're going to have pouring preparatory exercises in your classroom you need to give the children lots of opportunities to use that for real they need to be pouring their own water they need to be pouring their own juice for snack they need to be pouring for other people um, perhaps they're able to make herbal tea for guests and they need to pour pour the tea so please make sure that you are thinking out carefully so you don't have dry pouring exercises out three months after all the children have mastered them think through so that you can use what you have so you can shop your yard sales your thrift sales for for containers that are, are going to make any of your exercises in your classroom successful